congratulations on Jungle Cruise. Uh, the movie's a blast. I had such a good time with it. Uh, I am confident it's going to be a huge hit. But before we get into Jungle Cruise and a few other things, I have a few other questions, um, and they're going to be aimed at John Davis. So, Mr. Davis, I'm going to start with you. Okay. You have produced so many movies in your career, but I am curious, what is the white whale that has that you've never been able to get to the starting line? That's oh, a good, man, that's a there's good a question. movie that I've been working on. So there are some movies that took me 27 or 28 years to make, but I made The Man from Uncle, for instance, right? There is a movie I've been working on that I love for 30 years, and we keep getting close. And I've never gotten over the top. It's called Tricksters in the Madhouse, and it's about the Harlem Globetrotters. And in 1947, when they upset the Minneapolis Lakers, greatest upset in the history of basketball, and what was at stake was whether or not they were going to integrate the game of basketball in the NBA. And it is a great story. I love sports. It's a wonderful script. I keep getting close. I keep getting close. I keep getting close. That's the one I've never gotten over. Even nowadays with streaming and all the different people looking for content, is it, is it, do you feel like now it's even closer because of all these people looking? You know, every movie is its own challenge and getting any movie made is a challenge. Sometimes I think we feel like we've won um, um, the, the, the war. We just get the movie made and then we realize, okay, now it's gotta be really good. And now people gotta go see it, right? But even just crossing that finish line is so complicated and so difficult. Do you hold your actors in? Did you get an actor big enough? The studio is going to finance it. Did your director leave? Is he taking another movie? How do you get everything lined up? It's just, look, I can't believe we've done it 112 times because it's almost, it, it, it's almost a miracle when something comes together. Yeah, I think a lot of people, I've had this conversation with other producers and people that um, don't really understand how the movie business works would be dumbfounded at how scheduling can throw off an entire movie, one extra week of filming and everything is screwed. Yeah, exactly. That's sad reality. Yeah, it's very true. So you mentioned Man From U.N.C.L.E., which is a movie I love. Obviously right now, a sequel is not being made, but I am curious if you go back a few years, did, you, did it ever come up that you guys were serious about doing a sequel or was it not financially viable to actually move forward on another? That's one of those movies where literally we had five different directors before it finally happened. And every time we'd come together, it would come together with a big star and a big director and then fall apart. And then we'd come back together with a different star and a different director. And I think that the cast that we had on, on our movie would probably make it really hard. Back when it first came out, did you guys talk about making a sequel at all? Because I love that film. And I was just curious if it ever got like. No, we never, we never did get around to, to, to the sequelizing of that. Uh, jumping into, uh, I, I'm fascinated by the editing room because ultimately that's where it all comes together. So you've made, as you said, over a hundred projects. Um, which film of all of your films went through the biggest changes in the editing room from like what you thought you were going to deliver to what actually got released? Great question, because you pivot in every single movie in the editing room. You shoot a movie and then you remake it in the editing room. You know, people always say a movie's never as good as the dailies or as bad as the first cut. You're actually making a movie three times. You're scripting it, you're shooting it, you're cutting it right? Each time you're making a different version of the movie. It's always the case. John and I made a movie with David O. Russell and that movie got invented in the editing room seven different times because that's his process. Um, it, it's every single movie in the editing room goes through its own process because then you test the movie with audiences and then you find out that something didn't make sense to them or you test it with an audience and you can feel them in the room and you realize the third act's going to have to go in a different way, or you realize the end of the movie doesn't work. So it's a hard question to answer because literally every movie I've gone through that process, pivot, 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 pivot. Sometimes we reshoot. Um, you'd be surprised how different a movie is from the first cut you have until the last cut. But then you get the rare example, like a, a movie we did called Game Night, that after the first cut of the movie, 
is 98% of what the finished cut of the movie was. Um, first cut was was fantastic. We tested it. Audiences loved it. It tested, I think it was in the, in the high 90s and mid, mid to high 90s in the first test. And the studio went, great. I think we swapped out a couple of jokes, uh, you know, in edit room. And then that was it. We locked picture. A bunch of the Eddie Murphy movies that we made, I think we've made five of them um, because they're comedies. You know, there was a lot of when we tested with audiences and listened to where they laughed and whatever, there was a lot of, you know, kind of re-editing, some reshooting. You know, they eventually all ended up at the point where they really, really worked. They all, you know, were re- very big successes. Um, you know, Dolomite, funny enough, pretty much um, the first cut was the movie. You know, we yeah. tightened it a bunch. Um, you know, no reshooting. Um, kind of no rethinking the script. Um, so, and, and the first Doolittle, um, we did a, we did a reshoot and we did a lot of rethinking and a lot of reorganizing. I will say that for people that are watching this interview, um, who have not seen Dolomite movies, phenomenal and also game night. I mean, there's a reason Um, these movies were worked on the first cut because they're both fantastic films. Thank you. It's very sweet. Thank you. And we, and we did a movie with Will Smith called I Robot. And there was a lot of rethinking the third act of that, right? Um, and what ultimately came to be um, made so much more sense. Um, Storyline, visually, everything than the first cut. I am, so as someone who loves Hollywood and Hollywood history, I am curious though, if you ever save like an alt cut of some of these movies in like a vault in your office. So you have like the seven different versions of, the David O. Russell movie uh, somewhere in a box, or is it sort of like they just don't exist anymore? We have the scripts. We definitely have the scripts. Yeah, we have the scripts. (laughs) Every single script of every movie we've done, um, we have multiple drafts of, and we keep those, and we keep them in leather, some of them in leather-bound encasements, so they're really kind of, like, can be on the shelf, and, 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 you know, it looks great, and all of that stuff. Like Jungle Cruise. John and I have seen that movie, I promise you, 25 times maybe 30, you know, um, cause you watch it again and again, you test it with audiences and you watch it and, you know, then you watch it with the Disney execs, you know, and then you watch it, you know, you know, in seven other situations and you're in the editing room, always watching with the director. We were in the editing room on, on, on that movie a lot with JAMA rewatching, rewatching, rewatching the movie. Um, just cause there was a lot of film and it's a big movie. At the end of the process, you've seen the movie so many times you don't want to see it again. You've been producing since, I think since the 80s, John. I could be wrong. No, um, that's true. Right. So the, the, I am talking about the, eight, the 1880s, right? Right, exactly. Yeah. He was working with Fritz Lang back in the 20s <laughs> in Germany. Um, so, but I am curious, how has the business changed for you since then to the way movies are made now? Is there certain elements that are exactly the same or has the industry gone through some sort of radical shift in those? I'm, I'm not going to use the amount of de- amount of years, but this the amount of time you've been doing this. Four radical shifts. And yet it's still the same. And um, when I first started, it was the era of the movie stars and there were a lot of big movie stars. Um, and I feel like now we're in the age where the star is really the IP. The star is really the concept and there's fewer really big movie stars and 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 so that's kind of changed and i started cutting my teeth working with arnold schwarzenegger and i did movies with denzel washington and we did movies with eddie murphy and sly stallone and you know in the in those day and ages you got a big movie star you attach them to your script and you were making your movie um and that just kind of drove it and the and and the and and a movie star drove the box office Today, it feels like it's become an IP-driven business. And really, studios really only want either big tentpole blockbuster IP-driven movies or horror movies they can make for a price. It's gotten to be really hard to make comedies, although we're working on some that we love. Um, you know, but uh, really, really, really hard to get comedies made. Um, and then, you know, the other kind of big movement, and big change is business became very corporate over the years. It's all these companies were merged into larger companies. And so there's a lot less risk-taking that people wanted to do. And it became more of, on their part, 
you know, an algorithmic science. What was going to work? Do you have the elements? How much should the movie cost? And where should it go? Um, you know, in the early in the eighties and the early nineties, a lot of people would make movies they knew wouldn't work at the box office because they were prestigious for the studio. And a lot of good movies got made that way. You know, every once in a while you find out a movie's a humongous hit that you never thought would work. And you got a lot of experimentation and some really interesting movies that way. So some of that is no longer part of the business, although some of those movies now get made independently, but we all know that the independent movie business has become more difficult too, because a lot of that financing is dried up and a lot of the companies that make those movies have kind of gone out of business. What hasn't changed uh, is a producer, a producer who uh, can get the important people on the phone is, you know, that, that, that's the guy who's getting movies made. And I'm, I, you know, John and I have been working together for over a decade now. And I'm always astonished at his ability to get literally anybody on the phone. It, 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 is, it is his superpower. And a lot of producers pretend like they can get the fancy person on the phone. John gets the fancy person on the phone because he knows them. He went to their kid's bar mitzvah. He's had him over for dinner. He's always, I mean, John literally knows everybody in town. And that is not an exaggeration. He, I was at Jason Reitman's bar mitzvah. He was very good. <laughs> I was at Freddie Savage's bar mitzvah. <laughs> he was very good. It's true. Everybody. It, 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 Adam Sandler wandered into our office one day. He didn't know it was our office. Right, John? He wandered in. He, right. he wanders right into John's office. I'm sitting in there. We're having a chat about something. In walks Adam Sandler. And John says, Adam, hey, you, were, you made a video for my kid's bar mitzvah. <laughs> right? Right, John? And Adam's like, That's oh, true. Yeah. yeah, I remember that. <laughs> that I mean, I was there. I Look, I got to go hang out with Bruce Willis late at night. I wasn't even making his movie. But my wife and I, she's like eight months pregnant. And he said, why don't you come over and just shoot craps with me? And I said, all right. My wife and I went over to his trailer and in the middle of the night and we shot craps. It was great. I really hope that you've kept some sort of journal along the way. Uh, just because, my God, I can't imagine the stories. He, I really he, can't. This, you could do a whole, I'm telling you, you could do a whole podcast on John's story. He has the greatest stories. The greatest. My, my favorite stories, and I won't tell you now because I'll only bore you, are my Math Out Lemon stories when I did those five movies with those guys. Yeah, again, there's, uh, when you've made as many movies as you've made, there's the abundance of story. Look, I, I, I could dig so deep on some of these things, but I want to get into Jungle Cruise because I also have questions after Jungle Cruise. How long have you actually been attached how long have you been trying to make Jungle Cruise? Uh, we, so we brought the pitch, we brought an original story. Our, 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 we had put together a story. We brought it to Disney six years ago, about six years ago. Uh, they liked it and they said, can you get a movie star? And uh, we reached out to Dwayne. I made a movie with Dwayne years and years ago. So we kept in touch and, um, and uh, we reached out to him. He read, uh, he read the story, got back to us. I, I, I want to say like within 24 hours. And he said, I love it. I'm in. I've always wanted to play the Jungle Cruise captain. I'm in. And he, he, he personally called Sean Bailey that day and said, I'm your captain. Let's go. Let's do this. And then John Davis, because he can get anybody on the phone, he knows Alan Horn. And he called Alan Horn and had that conversation. And that we were off to the races. By the way, he's a lovely, lovely man, Alan Horn. He really is. And Sean Bailey really is a terrific, terrific president. Um, because he was a producer and a writer. And so working with somebody that really understands all those elements of the business enables you to work quicker and better and makes project really great. John Bailey is the sharpest creative executive I, we, I've ever worked with in my career. Uh, he just continually made the movie better. I actually, I know Sean. Uh, I got to meet him a, a while ago and uh, he produced Tron Legacy. So I- well, Exactly. Yeah. And uh, uh, there's a lot of stories there. But so you guys get Dwayne involved. Um, the thing about Dwayne is his schedule is like fills up two years out. Like his scheduling is very, very hard. So talk a little bit about the challenges of actually shooting this movie with his schedule. Well, it was really easy because I'm going to tell you what happened. So we get him attached and we get a script. And we had a script that everybody loves relatively quickly takes us about a year, maybe 14 months, which is really fast, right? Um, and then Sean says, let's all go over to Ballers. He's shooting on Ballers. 
let's bring him the script and bring him a gift. So we show up, walk onto the set, it's not even our show, with gifts and a script. And he and we kind of sneak in, you know, everybody's looking at us, what are you doing on our set? And we chat with him and he goes, thanks for the gifts. And they were lovely Disney bound books of the history of Disney. And I mean, the, the books were like huge coffee table books, right? Probably $300 books. They were really magnificent. Get Come over with like two or three of them, right? He reads the script and calls us Monday and says, I'm in. And so then it was just really getting a director that everybody liked and getting a start date. And it really went fast. Yeah, it did. And none of us expected, you know, um, coronavirus. And so that took up two years of the process, right? It feels like in the movie coming out, um, even though, or maybe at least it took up 18 months of the process, but it went really well and fast. And, and, and we, Dwayne loved the director idea that John and I went to him with. The studio loved it. It, it, was, a, it was not an obvious idea. But if you saw the movie, it ended up being the right idea. I, so I'm curious, talk a little bit. One of the things that I really enjoyed about the movie is the nods to the ride, especially the opening of the movie. It's, it's so connected. Um, was that always in the script? Can you sort of talk about that balance of making it so people that enjoyed the ride can find that kind of stuff in the movie? OK, so here's the background and I'll let John fill it in. I'll start it. We both. Um, went on that ride multiple times. We both went to Disneyland as kids multiple times. Two and a half billion people across all the Disney parks have been on that ride. It is one of the most visited rides in the history of Disney. Dwayne, John, and myself, and Sean Bailey, quite a crazy team, went to a secret building in Burbank that houses all of the vaulted ideas, original sketches, ideas, and thoughts of Walt Disney. It is a vault. I mean, it's it's the archives, and and it's you know it's like it's like the uh, it's like the warehouse at the end of Raiders. I mean, it's like you just you can't. But nobody nobody knows where it is. Nobody can access it. And we we were so lucky they brought us there. And we go in there, and every single sketch for the ride, every single sketch for Disneyland, you know, things he doodled, ideas, you know, and then you saw them come to life. We spent hours in there, and it was like insane. We kind of thought that Disney was in a cryogenic tube in there also. We weren't <laughs> sure, right? It was being preserved in that room. And it was so secret, right? And we went through all these layers of security to even get in there, right? It was like weird. I thought it was like going into the CIA safe house. Basically, the Imagineering people came in with us. And it was the synergy of how do we make the movie fit the ride? And how do we make the ride fit the movie? Because what you're going to see is what happened is the ride's been engineered to some degree based on the movie. Yeah, yeah no, to totally. And I've we heard. walked away. We walked away from that experience feeling uh, an intense um, obligation, you know, to honor the ride and honor Walt's vision for it. We we got to see Walt's vision for it. We got to see the original sketches. We got to see what you know what he was kind of vomiting out, you know. And it was uh, it, it was just extraordinary. See, we, we left feeling like you have to honor, you must honor that, but then also you know walk that fine line of of building out the story, building out the mythology, um, you know, and 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 delivering a cinematic, a big cinematic experience. And then on the way out of that building, they go, "Would you guys like to stay a few moments and join us for lunch?" And it's like, "What? Would you like to join us for lunch? We'll bring all the Imagineers in with you." They take us into this dining room which is this spectacular dining room in this secret building in this warehouse that is gorgeous, huge, gorgeous dining room. And we sit down and we all start talking and they start bringing in waves of food. It was surreal. Yeah. Um, when did you realize that, what day in your life did you realize you struck the lottery? I, I, that was the day. Uh, I, I did that day. That was the day. I mean, that, that was the day. All of us, even Dwayne. And Dwayne had access and met to every, he's met, met everyone, had access to everything. Even he was just like, holy shit. Like, this is, this is incredible. Yeah. I mean, we all felt so lucky to be there and, and I'm sure they'll never, they'll never let us back, but, but it was, it was amazing. Uh, you mentioned that the scripting went very fast and it was a fast thing to put together. What I love learning about the changes that go on behind the scenes. 
So was there ever a radically different version of this? Can you talk about alt versions of what this movie almost was? The first draft from Wekwa and Fakara, um, love those guys. They, they did the first draft and they laid a template. They, laid, they had the characters, uh, they had the basic story, they had the basic mythology. Um, and it was a fun draft. There, and there are still scenes um, and many ideas from their script that, uh, that have made it into the final, uh, into the final product. Um, we then brought in Payne and McKay, uh, fantastic writers, great guys. Um, and they actually wrote the greenlit draft, the draft that Dwayne signed on to and that the studio greenlit. In arbitration, they ended up not getting credit. Um, but they, those, those guys, they, they, they really did. They did a tremendous amount of work and they did great work. But they, they, they worked within the template that was laid by Reco and Fakara. They came in and just began to kind of reinvent some set pieces, change a character here and there. Um, and then from there, once we were greenlit, we brought on Michael Green. Um, and Michael came in and um, added such specific, wonderful dialogue and characterization. Um, and I believe it was Michael who changed, um, who changed Jack to her brother. Um, right. I think it was Michael who made that change. It might have been Payne McKay. My memory. It, it's been it's been a few years now. Um, but Michael really was the one who brought it. You know, he brought it to the finish line and he was with us through production. Justin Haith also came in for a little bit of work. Um, did some good work on it. Um, but Michael kind of saw it through to, to the end. Listen, you guys clearly spent some money making this thing. But no matter how much money you have uh, and no matter how much time you have, you're it's never going to be enough. So talk a little bit about maybe what ended up, did anything end up getting cut that was very close to being made due to whatever reason? I don't know. I mean, you know, we, we simplified certain parts of the movie to simplify the mythology just so that, you know, it was easier your first time through the movie to digest, right? When you, when you know the script really well and you know the movie really well, you know, it's possible that you can go down that um, that whole of, you know, making the mythology so complicated and cool and intricate that, you know, you'd have to see the movie three times to kind of get. And so we didn't want that, you know, to you know, be in the way of a, a fresh audience seeing the movie and being able to absorb it all. So we simplified that mythology a lot, um, especially in the end, um, you know, but I can't say that we really cut any big chunks of the movie. John? No, no, we didn't. We didn't. There wasn't anything that we had kind of conceived and then at the last minute for budget reasons had to, had to uh, uh, jettison. Um, no, I mean, it, it's, all, it's all on screen. Yeah, there wasn't anything major that we cut. I love learning about how movies are made. And so what do you think might surprise people to learn about the making of Jungle Cruise that they wouldn't read in press notes, they wouldn't read in the novelization or whatever advertisements are coming out well I, it'll take the fun away if i say that so i don't want to do that but we weren't actually really on the amazon river <laughs> <laughs> spoiler okay, alert it. spoiler right, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, i accept that what is something uh you know uh i i when we built that we built the entire town uh, in that opening, you know, in, in the setup to the story, we're in that town and, um, and we built it, the entire town. And I got to tell you, when you walked, when you walked in that, in that bar, which is featured in the movie, uh, and you walk in the marketplace where we have that big action set piece, um, you know, with, uh, with Emily and Dwayne, it, it, I mean, you were living it. It was it, those, I mean, they just did an incredible job. And we were, we were in this, um, kind of, uh, uh, remote, part of Kauai, um, very muddy, and, uh, and the working conditions weren't ideal. But uh, the, the finished product was, I mean, just it transported you to a different time and place. The magic of movies never, ever ceases to amaze me, man. I mean, the, the fact that we created something out of nothing. The thing that always, like the movie when I see it, you know, and I know where it was made, that it just overwhelms me that it was shot where it was shot. But Black Panther was shot in Atlanta, the entire movie. Yeah, yeah. Visual, visual effects nowadays. This actually leads me to a question I wanted to ask you guys. So I'm not sure if either of you are watching The Mandalorian, but they of use course. that technology. Yeah, I mean, the, the show's We're fantastic. Really Come on, the technology. of course. It's yes. really cool. So the, the volume technology that they're using is now spreading throughout the world. There's now in London, they're, they're developing it. They're We're, putting we're it working everywhere. on a movie that's used. We can't tell you yet the movie. 
but we're well into a movie um, where um, we've researched the stages. We know where they are. We're, we're, we're in early prep and that technology is going to be perfect for us. And it's really going to allow us to take a fairly, you know, simple story, but it all takes place, you know, um, in an airplane, right? Um, and we're going to be able to put the entire movie, except for maybe an end scene, the beginning scene, on a stage. And because of the way that technology works, we're going to be able with, um, um, you know, a really sophisticated director shoot the entire movie in 20 days. Yeah, if I knew what the movie was and the director would be able to ask more on that. But I, <laughs> I, I think that that technology is really, uh, and I hate the term game changer, but it, it is. It's a game word. changer. Absolutely. It, it's, a complete game, it's a complete game changer. And we're seeing the Good kinds question. of things you can do with it. I mean, you just have to go a couple, spend a couple of months beforehand shooting your plates, right, and processing them. And then you just go and you're in that world. The whole movie's in that world. I mean, it's insane. There's a new volume stage. It's opening up in Atlanta. Babelsberg now uh, has built out, I think, multiple stages. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it, it's, it is a game changer. It is the next wave in filmmaking. Yeah, no, 100%. 100%. Um, uh, at what point in the making of Jungle Cruise did you realize you were making something that's going to turn out really cool? We really felt like when we got the director on board, we heard his vision. Right. Because John brought a lot to this movie. Right. And he was the one that figured out the look and the lore of the conquistadors. And it was really cool the way he visualized them and saw them coming to life. Um, once we had Dwayne on board, the director's vision set. We were hopeful it was going to be great. Call it self-loathing but I never think anything I do is cool while making it. Cause I'm always thinking, Oh my God, we've fucked it up. <laughs> like we've, we've fucked it up. How can we make it better? I mean, I, I mean, even after the movie's done, it's like, you look and you go, it's, it's good. But you, all you see is like, where it could have been a little bit better, you know? And, uh, but I guess that's just a, well, well, it's a, like a when, curse, it, you know? It's like when John and I made Dolomite, right? It's like we make the movie and, and we see the first cut and we go like, this is really cool. Did we just make a movie just for ourselves? Right. <laughs> yeah. Did we just, you know, spend $45 million just making a movie for ourselves and Eddie that we just like, is our like, you know, kind of little project just ours. Right. Is anybody actually going to kind of understand that what we did is, is kind of funny and cool and interesting. This was a real guy. and This was a cool journey. And, and then we started showing the movie and we like, Oh yeah, people really like this. Yeah, but I have a wife who's always telling me, cut it out. Like it's good. Just embrace it that it's good. And it's it's the, pro <laughs> the problem is that uh, as someone who's and you guys have uh, you guys know this, sometimes you can have an amazing movie and it does nothing. And yeah. sometimes you can have a movie that you're like, I don't know if this turned out well, and it's a huge hit. Of course. There's no no rhyme or reason. No rhyme or reason. I'm basically out of time, but I do want to know what are you excited at your company? for projects that are on the cusp or things that maybe you want to tease, I am here for it. Well, I'll tease you just a little bit. So we're making a movie at Sony that I love that harkens back to where I spent a lot of time in this business, right? Making, you know, family movies. Um, and it's Harold and the Purple Crown and it's Carlos Sandano. And it's going to be Zach, Levi, and the script is amazing. It's these two amazing writers. Um, why am I blanking on their name, Johnny? Help me real quick. Handelman and Guillaume. Handelman and Guillaume, who are just brilliant writers, um, you know, written this from beginning to end. And we're going to start shooting November. We think it can be great. We're also going to start shooting a movie called The Uglies, based on Scott Westerfield's book series. You know, um, and, um, you know, my wife, Jordan, bugged me seven years ago, eight years ago, maybe it was 15 now, saying this is my favorite series. I've read it to our daughters. You know, we have to do this. And so it's only taken a 15 year journey from four different studios and two different networks and finally found its way to um, Netflix. We did sell 20 new movies during the pandemic. That's true. 
<laughs> so that's true. Yeah. And made so four sold, TV shows, and yeah, we were and, busy. And so we, yeah, so we have twenty new projects, and so we have musicals because we've gone musical crazy. We have science fiction. We have comedy. We have R-rated comedy. We have some family movies. I have one actual final question for you, uh, even though there's a thousand other things from License to Drive to you name it. <clears throat> but I am curious. Um, the Blacklist has it, it, you guys produce the Blacklist. Hugely successful show. Radical change just happened on the finale of this season. How long now that it's into season eight nine. contracts? Right. Season nine, nine. I'm sorry. Right. Contracts by now really have to be redone and you've made a radical change to the cast. Is this one of these shows that you see going like many more years or is it now at this point where it's year to year? It's year to year, but it could go for many more years. It, listen, James would keep doing it forever. He's made that clear. He'll keep doing it forever. He loves the character, loves just digging in, you know, to the, his, 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 his world. Uh, and, and the showrunner, uh, John Eisendrath, uh, he'd continue doing it forever as well. So if we're lucky enough to get the, uh, to get NBC to continue saying yes, why not? Why not? And by the way, I'm, I know I'm biased, but I think the show creatively in the last two years has, has been, uh, as good as it gets on broadcast television. I think it's been I know, phenomenal. I know I'm biased, but truly, uh, I think these guys, uh, have done an, an exceptional, job with the storytelling um so it just as a as a fan i'm excited to see what uh what what season nine holds and the fact that this cast hung in with us for eight years i mean for eight years literally all the original cast hung in with us that's phenomenal to get somebody to hang in that long i watch it because of james i think he's just such a talented actor um and i do love his character on it friend it was fun you have so much energy and enthusiasm and excitement this is a joy Absolute pleasure.